A lot of neighborhoods have quote-unquote haunted houses in them. You know the exact kind I mean. Houses that are for some reason abandoned and boarded up for a long time. No one really seems to know why, so all the children just decide the house must be haunted or something. The older kids make up weird stories about it, just in order to scare their siblings and their friends. It's always just a bunch of bullcrap, but it becomes legend with the kids in the neighborhood. My neighborhood had something even better than that. You see, we had this old abandoned hospital. That's all I really knew about it, really. I knew it had been abandoned for a very long time. The kids in the neighborhood all claimed it was a mental hospital, but I never really verified that for sure. We had this little town legend about it, at least amongst us kids. So the story went that this was a mental hospital, but when they closed it down, the patients were released back into society. One of the patients, a man the kids called Lucky, not the cleverest nickname, but were kids after all, considered the place to be his home and returned to living in it years afterward. Supposedly, this man lived in the basement and would try to kill anyone who ever entered his home. The kids in the neighborhood would always dare each other to break in and spend time in that old hospital. No one would ever actually do it, though. I'd been dared before myself. The closest I'd ever gotten was climbing over the gate. Once I was on the other side, though, I'm not too proud to admit I chickened out immediately and hopped back over. There was one kid in the neighborhood that did take the dare completely, so this story is not a first-hand account of what happened inside. It almost scared me to death not knowing what really happened to him. I was a high school freshman on Halloween. A bunch of us headed down to the hospital to go about the usual daring. Some of us would go right up to the gate, begin to climb over, and then chicken out right away. One kid, though, that I didn't really know well named Tom, was teasing us all mercilessly for being such cowards. He kept telling us that the stories of Lucky were just a bunch of baloney, and we were dumb for being so scared. About six of us had all chickened out and were being teased by this guy. We'd had enough of his crap. We told Tom that unless he was willing to put his money where his mouth was, he needed to shut the hell up. We were wrong in assuming that Tom was going to chicken out like us, though. He readily accepted our challenge and began to climb over the gate. He climbed over easily and jumped down on the other side. Then he waved at us and walked over to the door of the hospital. He actually tried to open the door as well. And that was more than any of us had ever done before. It didn't work, though. The door was locked. This actually gave Tom the chance to back out, but he didn't. After looking around for a bit, he found a large rock and used it to shatter one of the windows. We all got worried, of course. We thought the noise would attract somebody to the site, but that didn't happen. Tom broke the glass out of the basement window and then carefully lowered himself inside and out of sight. We were all pretty shocked at this point, and a bit ashamed of ourselves as well. The shame that we felt, though, in no way compared to the paranoia that settled in on us as we waited for Tom to come back out. At first, we were just impressed he'd even gone in. Then, we were more impressed that he was staying in there for quite a while. And that feeling of being impressed, though, began to fade into worry. Longer and longer, Tom still did not come back out of the hospital. It was bad enough when an hour had passed, even worse when two hours had passed, and absolutely dreadful when nearly four hours had passed by and not a single peep from Tom. It really began to bug us. We weren't sure why he hadn't come back out yet, but we were definitely speculating on it. Our first thought was that he was taking his time to try and scare us. The worst thought, and the one that became more and more realistic to us kids as time went on, was that Tom must have really come across Lucky, and he must have been unhappy to have someone invading his home. And Tom's disappearance put us all in a bad place. We weren't supposed to be hanging out here. If he didn't come back, we were going to have to go to our parents or the police, and neither of those choices were going to be easy. When Tom still didn't emerge for six hours, we went directly to the police. Maybe we should have gone to our parents first in hindsight, 
because when the cops called our parents out of the blue, the situation got even worse. I got chewed out in front of all the cops and all the other parents as well. While the chewing out was quite bad, what happened when the cops went to the hospital to look for Tom was much worse. They searched the entirety of the property. The basement, the rooms, the hallways, everything. There was not a single trace of Tom or anybody else. The police figured he must have just exited the building somewhere else and left us waiting on the outside for him, although Tom still hadn't returned home yet. The police told his parents he was probably just playing out this prank, but Tom didn't return that night, nor did he return the next day. He didn't return the next week. Search parties looked for him throughout the town, but he wasn't there. The hospital was searched more than once, and nothing was found. No Tom, no Lucky, no indication other than the window that Tom broke that anybody had ever been there at all. Posters with Tom's picture were put up in the post office and in stores, but he never showed up. This happened in the 70s, and to this day I have no idea what happened that night. Tom was never found. The guilt I've felt throughout the years is pretty bad, but not nearly as bad as the wondering. I never saw Tom again. I don't know what happened to him when he went into that abandoned hospital. I grew up living out in the country. My parents had a house that was set in a hollow and surrounded by tons of hills and forests. Even though I used to spend a lot of time exploring those hills, I was always able to find new places each time. It was great during the fall, actually. When I was 12, I went out for a good adventure. It was quite brisk outside, so I made sure to put a jacket on. The leaves had already turned for the fall, and the countryside was absolutely beautiful. I got started pretty early in the afternoon, because it got dark pretty quickly. The last thing I wanted was to get caught in the dark out in the middle of the woods. I had been hiking for a few hours through the forest when I began going downhill. At the very bottom of this hill, there was a huge treeless field. I had never seen it before. I was really fascinated, but even more interesting to me was the huge dilapidated barn I saw sitting in the middle of this field. Now, finding abandoned barns out in the hills is not an unheard of experience. In fact, I quite often came across many old abandoned buildings that have been buried in trees and bushes. This was different though. This was enormous, easily the biggest barn I'd ever seen in my entire life. Very excited, I headed down towards it. I noticed that the sun had descended a bit in the sky, and I cursed at myself for not leaving the house earlier. As it was, it seemed no matter how little time I spent exploring the barn, it would be quite dark by the time I got home. I figured it would be worth it, though. I really didn't expect to find anything interesting inside the barn, but it was still a bit of an adventure for me. I didn't realize exactly how huge this thing was until I was actually standing right outside of it. It was easily as tall as a five-story building. The boards were old, and the entire building was graying. It was weathered down pretty bad. Though I stood in front of the huge doors, which looked fairly solid as well, I wasn't even sure if I was going to be able to open them. I looked around, starting to get slightly nervous that someone who owned the land the barn was on might be around. I would have been able to see if anyone was, though the barn likely had been empty for years, maybe decades by the look of it. It seemed there wasn't much for me to be afraid of. However, tell that to a 12-year-old boy trying to explore with an active and vivid imagination. I opened the door, which wasn't locked. I pulled it open just enough for me to slip inside. Once I got in, it was even more awesome than I'd thought it was. The interior of this barn was wide open and plain enormous. There were many different lofts, which were accessible by trap doors and ladders, and hay everywhere. Tons of tools, such as pitchforks and sickles, hung on the walls. I searched around, and I felt like this was the coolest place I had ever been. After looking around for a bit, I found something else that was even cooler. As I was walking around, my foot slapped against something underneath the hay. When I brushed the hay to the side, I noticed my foot had hit the handle of a trap door. 
This was very exciting. I proceeded to clear the hay off the door and then tried to open it. It took a bit of effort to get it open. When I did get it open, I stood there in shock. In the room under this door, there were three people. Three skinny, naked people. They weren't just skinny, they were emaciated. When they saw me, two of them began to hiss at me. The third one looked at me, pure hate and anger reflected in his eyes. He began to growl at me and then screamed, Close the fucking door! I wasn't able to move at first. I was so utterly shocked I didn't know what to do. I stood there like an idiot holding that trap door. The two people who had hissed at me first sank deeper into the darkness of the hole, but the third one, the angry one, sneered. He bolted over on all fours, and when he got over to the ladder he began to climb it at an alarming speed. I didn't even have time to close the damn door. I freaked out and took off at the entrance of the barn. Looking back as I was getting out, the third person had actually gotten out of the room and closed the door. He came running after me. My twelve-year-old legs had never run faster before or since. I squeezed out and began running through the woods. Although it wasn't dark outside yet, the sun had gone down enough that it was not very bright. I looked back a couple of times before I got to the trees and saw the guy running on all fours straight at me. Once I got back to the trees, I didn't waste any more time looking back. It got completely dark long before I got home. It was a nightmare going through that forest in the dark, hearing that person still out there. Every sound I heard, every crunched leaf, every snapping of a twig, I jumped and felt like I was being followed. When I got back to my house, I climbed over the barbed wire fence and into my yard. Once there, I booked it till I got in the door. Then I locked it. I told my parents everything I had seen, but they really didn't believe me. My mom just told me I needed to stop making up stories. My dad told me that even if I really had seen such a thing, I had no business going into the barn to begin with. Obviously, the people weren't being held there against their will. He said a lot of weird stuff happens out in the woods, and it was best if I'd just forget about things like that. But how could I forget about it? When I went to sleep in my room that night, my eyes were focused on my window. I expected to look up and see that person looking in at me, his eyes inflamed with rage and hate. Whenever I was in those woods, I felt like I was being watched all the time. So don't ever go into an abandoned building. There was an old abandoned cat shelter just outside of town. It had garnered quite a reputation concerning why it was closed down. The prevailing but ludicrous theory was that they'd allowed a stray cat in there that had some sort of rare flesh-eating disease they weren't able to screen for, and therefore they weren't able to detect it before putting it in with all the other cats. All the others supposedly died, and the shelter lost all its funding as a result, and was forced to shut down. Some people claim there were tons of dead cat bodies in the building just because they hadn't even bothered to clean it out before they'd left. Obviously, that story was made up. It was so far over the top that no one with half a brain would ever believe it. It did lend an air of mystery and foreboding about this abandoned building, though. I myself used to always be really curious about this shelter. I wanted to go in and see what it was like inside. I knew it would probably just be boring, but I wouldn't know for sure unless I checked it out first. One night, I finally worked up the nerve to break into the building. I had to wait until it was around midnight because I didn't want to worry about being seen by other people. It was creepy, approaching this building in the dark, but I did have a flashlight on me. I had to search around quite a bit but eventually I found a broken window in the back of the building to climb into. This was convenient. I didn't really want to cause any more damage to this building. The last thing I needed was a vandalism charge on an old, broken, run-down building. Once I got inside, I began to search around in the various rooms. Much like I had originally expected, the shelter was not as interesting in reality as it was in theory. There was a lot of old furniture, some shelves, and documents, but there were no bodies of dead cats lying strewn about. There wasn't anything that indicated in any way why the place had closed down. 
It was just an old, broken-down building. As I was exploring, though, I heard a noise coming from down the hallway. Looking down from that direction, I could see it was coming from a room that seemed to be a huge cat playroom. They had a big cat tree, and it was closed off by a screen. I was curious. Perhaps a cat or some other sort of animal had snuck in there. I wanted to check this out. I entered the area around the screen and shone my flashlight all over the area, not really seeing much of anything at first. I then saw something moving underneath the cat tree. I shone my light on it. It looked like a blanket with something moving under. I moved closer to the screen, figuring I was safe. Whatever I was looking at was way in the middle of the play area, but definitely something was moving. I kept looking at it trying to figure out what was going on. It was then that I noticed the blanket being pulled slightly to the side and saw someone's eyes peeking out at me. He looked directly into the flashlight. He probably wasn't able to make out much about me, but as soon as he saw me, he pulled the blanket down and glared at me. Stay away from my kitties. Leave my kitties alone! He got up and threw the blanket to the side. The man ran up to the screen, causing me to step back and trip in shock. I fell right on my ass. The man pressed his face against the screen and began to chew on the mesh. He repeated, Leave my kitties alone! I could see him slobbering all over as he pressed his face up against it. It was then I noticed he was holding what looked like the dead body of an animal, which I assumed to be a cat. One hand was vigorously petting it as he yelled at me and gnashed at the screen. It was hard to tell what was going on, but I didn't want to wait around to find out. He didn't seem like he wanted to kill me or anything, but I didn't want to take the chance and find out what he did want to do. I jumped off my ass and took off running out the door. As I ran back to the window I had crawled into, I could hear the man yelling at me, telling me to leave his kittens alone. It was freaky. I heard the man's voice clearly behind me, even as I was crawling out through the window. After I got out, I could hear him screaming and crying and howling. I ran as far away from that place as I could. I suppose the experience wasn't life-alteringly scary, but it was pretty creepy in the moment when it happened. The man was obviously disturbed, and that was the worst part of it. It was nice to know that the animal shelter was simply an abandoned building. I figured the guy was a homeless man who moved in or something, but obviously he'd let the place get to him. A couple of years ago, my parents went on a vacation together, and me and my ex-boyfriend who lived with us at the time stayed home. I was around 17 at the time this happened. One of these days, it all got to be too much for me, and I decided to kick the mentally abusive asshole out of our house and break things off cleanly. I decided I needed to take my mind off of things and called one of my friends who lived in a city an hour away from me. She was fine with me coming over, so I took the first train there, and we met up at the train station. By this time, it was somewhere around 2300. This city is known for not being the safest, and she lived in one of the sketchiest parts of town. I'm not much of a scaredy cat myself, so I didn't really think too much of it. We grabbed something to eat real quick, and were off on our way to her house. We had been walking for all of ten minutes, when suddenly this huge guy on a bike started riding next to us. He greeted us way too happily and started talking right away with this huge smile on his face. Immediately, I felt stressed out by this behavior. He was acting way too enthusiastic towards us. We kind of tried to make it clear we had no interest in talking to him without being rude. He continued to follow us for five more minutes. I was starting to realize there weren't any people ahead of us and to any outsiders. It seemed like this guy and us must know each other and were having a normal conversation. All of a sudden, though, just when I was beginning to get freaked out, he looked behind him a couple of times. I swear to God, I was sure we were going to be murdered in just a moment. Instead, he leaned in and softly whispered to us, I'm sorry for freaking you out. I saw you guys leave the food place. I saw a couple of guys start pointing at you and stand up to follow you. I decided to follow as well in case they had any bad intentions. And just keep walking. Pretend you know me. I looked behind me. Sure enough, there was a group of four people. 
all dressed in black and covering their faces following behind us. I had seen them when we were grabbing food. The chance of them leaving the place at the same time to walk the exact same way was so small, I was sure they were following us. I don't know what that group of guys following us intended to do, but they followed us for quite a ways. They never tried anything in the end, though. Basically, the guy just biked next to us the entire time until we arrived at my friend's house. We texted her male roommate to come downstairs, and the four of us stayed in front of the door, talking as the group of guys passed us by. They disappeared down a random corner. We didn't want to send the guy on his bike on his merry way right away. We were afraid the group would go after him because he'd helped us. This is an older story, something that happened to me almost 20 years ago, when I was 23 years old. I was writing for a popular budget travel guidebook series, and mainly worked in Central and Eastern Europe. Depending on the time of year and which issues were being updated at the moment, I could be gone for several weeks or even several months at a time. Mainly, I traveled alone. I'd run into a few problems here and there, but my experience was predominantly positive. I had been working in the former Yugoslavia and was on my way to the Czech Republic. It was a long journey by train, so I broke it up into several overnight stops. Zagreb first, then Budapest, making each leg around eight hours. It was late January and very bitter. There was probably a good seven inches of snow on the ground, perhaps more in some places. I was exhausted and battling the remnants of a flu I'd picked up and split. I left in the late afternoon and expected to reach Budapest around 10 p.m. I bought my ticket in the travel center and when I boarded the car, about half the compartments were empty. There were definitely some other people on it though. Since the train wasn't too crowded, I managed to find a compartment all to myself. I spread out a bit because of this and prepared for a long ride. The first part of the ride was very smooth. I worked on some guidebook stuff, wrote some notes in my journal. A few hours into the ride, though, we passed over the Hungarian border, and things started to go awry. I heard them before I saw them. They were a group of teen boys, about five of them that I could see, and they were quite loud. I could hear them running through the train car, laughing, cursing, and banging on the compartment walls. They were loud and obnoxious, but it's not the first time I'd ever been annoyed by a group of teenagers. I didn't even look up. I kept on working on my writing. As time went on, though, they grew louder and louder. As they ran from car to car, they slid the train doors open with so much force it sounded like a bomb going off every few minutes. Then they got even louder. That's when I noticed they were standing right outside my compartment, looking in at me. I could only see three of them through the small window, but there were definitely more behind them. I'd seen them earlier. I glanced up at them, frowned, and then looked away. I'd learned the best way to deal with this kind of thing was to just ignore them. I didn't want to encourage this behavior, but ignoring these guys seemed to be having the opposite effect. Lady, lady, they hollered at me. Come have some fun. The compartment door was closed. They proceeded to mess with me by slowly opening it, pretending they were going to come in, and then slamming it shut again. They went from chanting, girl, girl, to a much more ominous, we're gonna fuck tonight, and you'll fuck us all, followed by a bunch of slang. At this point, I started to grow nervous. How was I to know whether they were just messing around with me or being completely serious? I mean, I couldn't exactly leave. I'd have to walk through them to do that. They were blocking my only exit and entrance. Then, one pulled out a pocket knife. He stuck out his tongue, ran the blade across it, then pointed it at me and grinned. I tried not to show anything, but my mind was quickly taking stock of what items I absolutely had to take with me if I made a break for it. My lack of reaction seemed to anger the one with the knife, so he switched from licking it to using it to penetrate a circle he'd made with his thumb and forefinger. You're gonna die, he called out. Part of me figured they couldn't really do anything. 
There were other people in the train after all, and surely they'd hear me scream. Someone would come and help me, right? The conductor hadn't come through since we did the border crossing, so he was due for a trip around this time as well. I figured I only had to get through the next few minutes, and then they'd get bored and leave. It was at this point I noticed the curtain on the door window. I know it sounds crazy, but that's when I lost it. I'd left the curtain open so people walking by could see the compartment was occupied, but now all I could think was that if they came in, all they'd have to do was pull the curtain closed, and nobody walking past would see what they were doing to me. At least one of them had a knife. They were taller and bigger than me, and they outnumbered me. I started to tear up. What was going to happen to me? I was 23 years old, but a late bloomer. I had a history of sexual assault, too. My day pack was in my lap, and the only things I had in there that could be weapons were a fingernail file and a butter knife. I reached into my bag and fumbled around until I had one in each hand. The first guy slid the door open and stepped inside. Knife pointed at me. Another voice filmed the corridor. I didn't need to speak the language to hear the anger. The kids ran from my compartment, the one dropping his knife. I watched as a middle-aged man dressed in blue stomped after them. A few seconds later, the train came to a grinding stop. The world outside was so creepy. All I could see was snow and blackness. There were no lights in sight. After a few moments, the train started back up again. The boys did not return, though. I was just starting to feel some relief when the man returned to my compartment. It seemed he was the conductor. You speak English? He asked. I nodded. I made them leave. They're gone now. I thanked him and he came into my compartment and sat down across from me. It felt good having another person in there with me, especially an official. I felt safe now. It's okay. They're gone. Thank you, I replied. I was so scared. He nodded knowingly and leaned back into his seat. It happens sometimes. We get people like this. They can't hurt you though. I honestly felt like I was going to pass out from emotional exhaustion. Just as I was starting to let my guard down though, the conductor leaned forward again and said, You need the fee. Oh, I produced my ticket and showed him. Well, here's my ticket. He looked at it, shrugged, and handed it back to me. This is a ticket, yes, but there's a fee for Hungary. He didn't pay. This was the second time I'd made that route, and I'd never had to produce anything extra on the train itself. Now I started feeling sick to my stomach. He quoted me a number around 50 USD. I knew he was taking advantage of me. I wanted to argue, but then he said, If you don't pay, then you have to leave now and get off with those guys. We were literally rolling through the blackest night I'd ever seen. The snow looked like it would come to my knees. I didn't want to be dumped in the Hungarian countryside with those boys who were harassing me. I felt like I didn't have a choice. He waited while I rooted around in my backpack and produced $30 in a combination of Czech, Bosnian, Croatian, and Slovenian bills. I left myself 20 USD. With that, he took the wad of cash and stuffed it into his pocket, and then he bolted out of there. Once he was gone, I gathered my things and headed to the bathroom. I had to pass by the other compartments as I walked down the corridor. It was that moment I realized I'd been wrong the whole time. There were no other riders in the other compartments. They'd all left at some point. I was the only person in my car. If the guys had come in and attacked me, nobody would have been there to help. I'd have been all on my own. I cried for five solid minutes in that tiny bathroom and then threw up in the middle sink. So I walk to most places I visit, because being severely visually impaired, obviously I cannot drive. I walk at night during summer, which lasts anywhere from April to October if we're lucky. This is probably not the safest idea, but I'm from Texas, so temperatures of 100 degrees plus aren't that unusual. One of my more usual destinations was a convenience store a few blocks from my previous home. I set out one night, just like normal, to grab myself some Pepsi in a candy stash. Our town was not very big, and most other people drove everywhere. It was very unusual to come across anyone else on my route to the store because of this. 
On this night, though, a man suddenly appeared out of nowhere and started to talk to me like he knew me. He asked me where I was going, and I told him I was just going to the store. It wasn't unusual for people to keep watch on me, because hard of hearing blind girls with forearm crutches might need a bit of help, I guess. This guy had no reason to be out there, though, and was walking way too close beside me. He asked me where I was going, and I told him just in case I was overreacting. I sped up as much as I could, since this part of the route was very dark, with only a subway that had already closed for the night. He was definitely not there for a $5 foot long. I tried to appear calm. I was shaking to the point, though, that I was afraid I'd drop my crutch, which was the worst thing I could do right then. Especially after he started talking about how easily he could have his way with me in a ditch and no one would ever know. I felt sick, but I continued on walking. What else could I do? The store was only about 20 yards away. Luckily, I happened to know the guy who worked there on the graveyard shift. I got safely inside. My friend handed me a bag to carry my stuff until I was ready to check out. When I got up to the register, he began to speak loudly enough that my ears hurt. I had to turn my hearing aid down because it hurt so much. Hey babe, you ever find my 3DS? I played along and he opened the half door thing and I sat on a stool like it was normal. The creepy dude came over and slammed his Bud Light and a 10 on the counter. After being handed his change, he went outside. We waited for a bit before my friend spoke to me. He's still out there waiting by the ice machine. After about 20 minutes, he still had not left yet. My friend called his manager, and after explaining the situation, she told him to lock up and take me home. He did and even walked me in through my door. We stepped inside together. Catherine told me to give you this. He handed a keychain to me and showed me how to lock and unlock the pepper spray. Then he said this, Hey, call us before you come from now on. That man has been following you for the last four weeks or so. He comes in after you every time. He left and I made sure the door and window was locked that night. So this event happened to me back when I was 20 and was going back from my aunt's house where I'd give lessons to my little cousins each week. I was a student back then and it happened in winter when it was quickly dark around 5 p.m. I must also say I'm a woman and unfortunately that's not very helpful when it's getting dark out. I was going back to the train station to take the direction home because I lived quite a few stations away from my aunt. At that time, it was around 6 already. It was really dark and cold outside. I remember being particularly tired, too, so I didn't give much attention to the direction the train I was waiting for was going to. As soon as it rolled in, I went inside. It was really crowded, so I stood up for quite some time. That didn't help much with how tired I already was. After some time, my seat finally cleared up. I snapped it up as fast as I could. I let out a heavy sigh that attracted the attention of the people beside me. I was a little ashamed by that, so I just looked down at my phone and didn't pay much attention to the others for the rest of my ride. At some point, though, I noticed the guy in front of me looking really intensely right at me. Then again, I was so tired, I didn't really think much about it. I just continued watching whatever was on my phone at the time. As we rolled into a station, the train stopped and the driver informed us that was the last stop. I had my headphones on, so I didn't hear the entire message. I thought I had to stay on the same train and it would just go back on the same line after a few minutes. While everyone else went out, I just switched places to go somewhere with no one beside me. It was a seat comfortably near the window. When the train was soon to start again, the man that was looking at me earlier walked straight into my zone and sat right in front of me. I was focused on my phone, though, and didn't pay much attention to him. It was quite strange, though. The entire wagon was empty where I was. There were tons of empty seats where he could have sat, but he chose right next to me. The train started up again, and I was happy to finally be able to approach my home. As some stations passed by, though, I noticed something odd. 
The stations were the ones I had already passed by before. In fact, the train was going back to the direction of my aunt's house, not where I lived. I realized I hadn't heard the message right in the first place. I was a little bit angry because of this, but most importantly, I laughed at myself. It was the first time I was so tired I'd done such a mistake. As I was smiling at my own foolishness, I started to look around me. I saw the man sat before me. He was looking confused while switching his gaze between me and the windows. I laughed and gave him a small smile. I thought he'd also gone in the wrong direction too, since he had been in the same train for a long time now with me. But he didn't smile back. Instead, he glared at me and got very angry. I remember getting a chill at that moment. My senses finally woke up to make me realize there was something wrong with this man. I stopped the video I'd been watching and started to think. I had two options. The first one was to just stop at the next station, change sides to take the train that would actually get me home. That was the most logical and normal option. I didn't know why, but something in my gut told me I shouldn't go home alone tonight because of the man in front of me. I decided to stay on the train instead and see if he would get off before me or not. After all, I was sure this was not his direction either. I stayed. At least four stations passed by, but he didn't move at all. Instead, he seemed to get much more confused and angry with each passing station. He was glaring at me a lot, switching to the windows each station, as if he was waiting to see which one I would get off on. Now he was giving me a real scary look. I tried to avoid his gaze as much as possible. At some point, he started to push his leg against mine. It's like when the train is riding fast and because of its movements you sometimes touch people near you and bump slightly into them when it's crowded. Him doing that was not natural though, because the train was almost empty. After some time, I was really getting awkward. Even when I changed position to be away from him, he would constantly rub his legs up against mine. It pissed me off. I looked straight at him, and then I knew immediately I was in danger. He was looking at me with this huge smile on his face, since he'd noticed I was now reacting. I was terrified. When the train stopped again at a station, I didn't really think. I jumped out of my seat and started to go out. He followed behind me. I was really scared. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want him to follow me home because I lived in a really secluded place. If he were to follow me all the way, at some point he would be able to do anything to me, near my own home. There would be no one around to hear or help me. I was trying to think fast, when suddenly I got an idea. I stayed near the train before the door closed and walked near it like nothing happened. He was still following me and looking at me, but I tried to remain calm. When I heard the sound of the door about to close, I jumped back inside the train again. Right when the door was closing, he couldn't get in on time. I saw him looking at the closing doors in shock. He looked at me like he wanted to kill me. I went back to my seat and stared at the window looking at him to see what he would do. He was so furious. I was scared he was going to break the glass and jump right at my neck. The train finally started again. It was gradually pulling away from the platform. The man was staring at me, following me with his gaze the entire time. When the train finally passed that station, I started breathing normally again. After that, I stayed on a few stations and finally got off and changed sides to take a train in the direction of my home. I was looking behind me the whole time and ran home as fast as I could. It was only when I was in my room that I fully realized what had happened. That event was really a change for me. Before that, I was really carefree when I took the train or the subway. But from that time on, I started being a lot more cautious of my surroundings, especially when returning home at night. My mom's dog, Punky, was a very sweet, loving dog. She was an ESA dog, but trained to be a service dog for PTSD before she lost her leg. I had never seen her get aggressive with anyone in the entire 12 years she'd lived. Never growled, never nipped at anyone. She had no sense of smell, so she loved all animals and people. A real gentle giant among our little terriers at 60 pounds. What I'm getting at here is that her barking at something and being aggressive 
was so wildly uncharacteristic that I only ever saw it happen one time. I was 11 at the time this happened, and at home with my siblings who were 6 and 2 respectively. My then stepdad was at work. My mom had to go to the gas station to grab a pack of cigarettes. It was only a mile or two away, so it wouldn't take that long. For reference, we lived in a two-bedroom trailer in the middle of the woods on a dead-end road at the time. You had to really make an effort to get down there, find our house, navigate that rickety-ass driveway, and find our door. I was sitting there at the computer, having a grand old time watching some YouTube videos, when all of a sudden our dogs jumped up and started investigating down the hall. My siblings were both napping in the bedroom at the end of that hall at the time, so I figured they just stirred a bit and scared the dogs. Then though, Punky jolted upright, stood on the couch and puffed her chest out. Her ears were perked up, fur standing on end, tail straight upright. She started to bark loudly. It boomed through the living room and echoed all around. All of a sudden, she jumped off the couch and went tearing down the hallway. I was already on edge because I'd never heard her bark before. I stood up and went to look down the hallway, ready to fight off what I was assuming was a shadow monster based on how the dogs were acting. But then, I heard it. Knock, knock, knock. We didn't get visitors because of how weird our home was location-wise, so my 11-year-old mind had no clue what to do here. The only people who would ever show up were family, and they would never knock. I slowly walked toward the door. The knock drew the attention of the dogs, and they came running back down the hallway, all except for Punky. I felt better with these three yappy dogs in the room with me, even if they were the size of a New York City sewer rat. I opened the door just a bit, only to see standing on our porch the sketchiest man I'd ever seen. I can still picture him perfectly. Extremely thin, a taller man with dark hair and a sunken face, heavy bags under his eye, and half-managed hair, like he'd just given it a quick brush and figured that was good enough. Everything about him just seemed too thin, a little too shallow. His clothes were all off too. They were nice, but like, fake nice, you know? Like a clean, newer-looking t-shirt and new jeans. Like one of those suits you'd buy from a factory or something. All his clothes were real dark, too, despite the fact it was summer in Texas and it was definitely well into the hundreds that day. He had a plain, unlabeled bottle in his hand. It looked like it had been covered up and taped over. I stared at the man in confusion. I definitely had never seen this guy before. I asked him what he wanted. He smiled in a way that was obviously fake and spoke in the same voice retail workers do. Hey there, kiddo. I'm trying to sell this here carpet cleaner. You mind if I come in and show you how good it works? Alarms were already going off in my head. This was just way too weird. Looking back with an adult perspective, the fact he didn't even ask if my parents were home at all is unnerving. That meant he probably knew they weren't, and that was why he was there in the first place. I should have told him to get the fuck off our property, that I'd have to go talk to my mom. I didn't say that, though. Instead, I shook my head and said, We don't have a carpet. Well now, hold on a minute. It works on other things, too. He took a big step toward the door and shook the bottle at me. I started to freak out and was about to close the door. Thing is, our front door wouldn't even lock. It was broken and basically useless. I was sure something very bad was about to happen. I was terrified as I thought about what to do in the few seconds I thought I had before it did happen. When all of a sudden I heard it, Punky had crept up from the hallway, lowered towards the ground with her teeth barred, snarling like she was feral. Slobber was flying from her mouth, her ears down, and she was ready to pounce. The guy heard it too. As I looked toward Punky, she tried to lunge past me. I just barely caught her as she tried her hardest to duck past me and attack this guy. The man freaked out and ran off the porch without saying another word, booking it down the driveway as I let Punky out along with the rest of our dogs and they started chasing him. Our small dogs chased him down the driveway and stopped about halfway, barking and jumping about. 
Punky stopped just on the porch, though, and watched him vigilantly, staring into the distance until he disappeared. As he ran down the road, I swear I saw someone join up with him when he got onto it. The second he disappeared, Punky's entire body language changed, and she went back to being the sweet dog I knew. No barking or growling, just laying around, mouth and throat covered in slobber still. I realized my siblings were still in that room, and ran to check on them. When I got to the bedroom, my siblings were sleeping soundly still, but the bedroom window was wide open. The curtains pushed all to one side, and items on the dresser in front of the window all shoved around. Someone had definitely been trying to climb through, no doubt in my mind. From what I can gather, the bedroom window was visible from the couch where Punky had been sleeping. I think someone was trying to climb through the window before Punky went after them and scared them off. The man at the door was obviously meant to distract me. They definitely hadn't expected Punky, because most of the time she was with my mom inside. While our small dogs were the ones the public saw more often, I don't know what they intended to do, but after my mom got home, she took all of us to my aunt's house. On our way there, we saw the men walking up someone else's driveway. Men, plural, because we watched a second one split off to wait by the road. So this happened back around 2004 or so, when online dating wasn't as prevalent as it is nowadays. I had met and gone on a few dates with local guys, but nothing had come of it so far. One evening, as I was idly searching, I happened upon someone who was my age and had almost identical tastes in music, hobbies, and interests as me. I messaged him and we started chatting pretty quickly. He seemed interesting enough, so we agreed to meet up for coffee downtown. I didn't notice anything off-putting as we ordered our coffee and hung out for a while. We mostly talked about very mundane things. I found out he was a medical student at a local university. All in all, he seemed like a pretty normal guy. That is, until after we finished our coffee, and he told me he wanted to go for a walk around the city. It was around this time that I noticed his demeanor starting to slowly change. He seemed to grow very tense, and he got this gleam in his eye. He kept rubbing his hands over his thighs, as if to dry off his sweaty palms. He got very quiet as well. I started to get really nervous because of this. I also noticed that in our stroll together, he seemed to be leading me further and further away from the populated downtown area. All my attempts to continue conversation were met with half-responses and mumbles from this now heavy-breathing, increasingly weird-acting guy. He was acting so strange that I suggested we needed to go back toward downtown. I turned around and started to go back the other direction when he reached out and grabbed my arm. No, wait! He half-breathed and half-mumbled. We need to sit down. There's something important I need to tell you. Alarm bells were going off in my head like crazy. I knew I had to get away from this guy, but by this point we were far enough away from the downtown crowd there would be no one to come to my immediate aid. I numbly allowed him to guide us over to a bench and sit down. He held fast to my arm. He turned and stared at me, in a way I can only describe as a predator eyeing prey. He menacingly and proudly disclosed the fact he had been watching me for a very, very long time. He began to rattle off all this information he had been gathering about me. He knew which places my friends and I liked to hang out at. He liked to listen to me laugh in the background and talk with others. He would just hang in the crowd watching me. He knew where I lived. He knew where I worked, when I worked. He knew where I went to school and when I had my classes. He told me he had been following me for so long. That's when he finally found me on the dating site. He'd specifically tailored his profile to mirror mine so he could finally get me. Still clutching my arm, he slid his other hand over to squeeze my thigh. He told me that now that he had me, he was never going to let me go. The whole time this guy was rambling, I was acting nonchalant as I could, nodding like none of this was a big deal. Inside, I was obviously freaking out. 
As subtle as I could, I pulled out my phone and was texting my guy friends that I was in danger with one hand, and I needed immediate help. One of them responded that he was in the area. He raced over to where I was right away. My heart was already pounding out of my chest when I saw my guy friend's truck pull up down the street. I waited until he was close enough to be in sight, and I ripped myself away from the grip of this creepy guy beside me. I started to run at my friend. The creepy guy chased after me, screaming obscenities. I could feel him gaining on me as I threw myself into the bed of my friend's truck. He sped away, the creepy guy still on the sidewalk shouting and swearing. That was the last time I fooled around with online dating. I have no idea what this guy's plan was, but I'd never been more terrified in my life. I was just home for Christmas and was reminded by my father of a story he'd told me once before. My father moved to Manhattan from Peru in 1970. One night during this time period, he was out at a bar with his friend Carlos, who was also from Peru. Sometime during the night, they were approached by this well-spoken, friendly, and nicely dressed American man. He offered to buy them a few rounds, and they spent some hours together drinking and talking. After a while, the man invited them back to his apartment, somewhere on the Upper East Side. He said this was to keep drinking and hanging out together. My father instantly and instinctively knew this was not a good idea, but Carlos, severely drunk and chasing more free drinks, stupidly insisted they take him up on it. They arrived at the apartment, and after an hour or so, Carlos had passed out altogether, sitting up in the man's reclining chair. Everything had been fine so far, but my dad was never comfortable with the idea and now knew there'd be even more complications with Carlos passed out. He was really stressing out at this point, so he went to the bathroom for a minute to splash some water on his face and sober himself up a bit. As soon as he stepped inside, he noticed a large pair of scissors sitting right on the sink. They were way larger than any normal household pair, kind of like the tools you'd see in a hospital setting. He told me that at this moment, his entire body was overtaken with instinct. Something inside him told him to pick up those scissors. He grabbed them and put them in the waist of his pants, right behind his back. When he walked back out into the living room, he found the man with his hand on Carlos's leg. He asked the man what he was doing and said they were leaving right now. The man told him to just relax and keep drinking, but enough was enough at this point. My father was leaving. At this point, the man's face dropped, his voice lowered, and his whole demeanor changed. You are not going anywhere, was the man's reply. He produced a large knife. Upon this, my father pulled the scissors from behind his back and locked eyes with the man. They stood in a tense stalemate for a moment as my father called out to him. I've got scissors and you've got a knife. If you come for me, I'm getting you too. The man realized the stalemate. He pointed the knife at my father for a moment more, then looked down and said, Get the fuck out! My dad shook Carlos awake, practically carrying him to his feet. He pushed him out the door, never taking his eyes off the man, nor his hands off that pair of scissors. As he left, the man stood in the door and glared at them as they backed down the hallway to the elevator. My mom was a single parent of three kids. We were pretty poor, so she worked pretty much 24-7. This meant that as kids, my siblings and I spent a lot of time home alone. Well, this story happened when I was 14, at the very start of summer. My older sister had moved out by then, and my little brother got sent to stay with my grandpa for the summer. This meant I was home alone from about 7am to 6pm every weekday. I didn't really mind too much though. I spent most of that time playing Neopets or watching awful daytime TV. Well, one day, I had not long woken up and my mom had gone to work hours earlier. It was around 12 p.m. or so. I got up to make some food, let my dog outside, and settled down on my bed to eat a bit. 
I remember watching Rock of Love, and remember exactly the bit of show I was watching too when this happened, even though it happened so many years ago. As I was sitting there watching, I heard a loud smack on my window. My window was a double window that needed two blinds, two curtains, etc. This meant there was a tiny gap where you could see through the very middle of them, where they didn't quite touch together. I saw a shadow along with that sound. I also heard some logs falling down. Outside my window, there was a pile of firewood for the winter. I got up and walked over, thinking perhaps a branch or something had smacked against it. And that's when I saw it. A huge handprint left on my window right where the tiny gap was between my blinds. I freaked the fuck out. I couldn't even breathe. I was so scared. I called 911 and then my next door neighbor, who was a family friend. He ran over as soon as I said what happened, and he found the guy there still. A man in his mid-forties, sprinting out of my backyard into the street ahead. My neighbor tried to keep him there until the police arrived. When they got there, I told them what happened. They looked into the guy to see if he had a past, but nothing seemingly came up. He had been dating and living with another neighbor three doors down from my house for a few months. When asked what he was doing at my window, he told us he was never there. He was just looking for something. I don't remember his exact excuse. I just remember him saying it happened to be in my backyard. The police got a statement from him, and the neighbor who caught him and myself thought it would help to get him put away or something. I know, it's stupid, but I was a teen. I didn't know any better. They just let him go and didn't do anything. I waited to hear from them regarding next steps we could take, but I never got another reply. From then on, my anxiety was awful. I had motion lights set up outside my window as well, making sure I was never sleeping alone too. But it wasn't enough. I could never rest. Now I felt like I was constantly being watched everywhere. Who knows, maybe I could have been. How did this guy know I would be home alone? What did he want to find me doing? I felt so unsafe. Fast forward two months later. I'm staying with my best friend who lived across the street from me, and we were both in the shower. We saw a shadow walk up to the bathroom window. It was glazed over, so you couldn't see anything properly. I wiped off some of the steam, and who do I see? That guy from my window the other time, running away from the bathroom as I popped it open. I told my friend who it was, and we both freaked out together. We called the cops again, and again they did nothing. Worst part was, no one even believed me, minus the guy who'd found him the first time. My mom told me I was too fat for a guy to want to creep on me, and that I was just being dramatic. Nothing happened to the guy. He did this multiple times after, and I have to wonder how many others he did it to as well. The woman he was living with had a very young daughter at the time too. It still haunts me, though I guess it shouldn't. It just scares me. We can go on with our lives, and someone could be watching and waiting to prey on us, and we would never know. What would he have done that night if he hadn't accidentally knocked the firewood logs over? I'll never know. First, I guess I should say that when I was growing up, my mom had a lot of undiagnosed mental health issues. One of the more minor things she suffered from was extreme anxiety and social awkwardness, but in this case, it had a significant impact on what would come. I must have been around the age of 8 to 10 years old. I can't remember exactly. We lived in a very small town in the north of Scotland, which also happened to be only a mile or so away from a sort of spiritual retreat that was fairly well known. And because we had this spiritual place so close to us, we would get a lot of, shall we say, weird people coming into town. Now, I don't mean to suggest that spiritualness always equals weirdness, but the reality is, it did attract a lot of strange people to the area. One day, I, my mom, and my little brother went up the high street to get some groceries, just a usual Friday afternoon. Outside the grocery store, just before making our way home, there was this guy with a large dog. Off the top of my head, I can't remember what breed it was, but it was one of those huge ones with the beautiful pure white fluffy fur. My brother and I were fascinated by it. 
the guy got to chatting with my mom for what seemed like an eternity. Eventually, she managed to get him to stop bothering her, and we started walking home. The guy with the dog had this van. Instead of just saying goodbye and going on his way, he shoved his dog in the back and proceeded to drive behind us at a pace slower than we were walking at. When we got home, he parked right outside our front door. When we got in, my mom shut the curtains and said to just ignore him. On Saturday morning, my brother and I got up early. When we peeked out the curtains, he was still there, standing with his dog right outside the wall to our garden and staring in through our living room window. It feels weird to even say this now, but honest to God, our mom made us turn off all the lights and crawl around so the guy would think we were not home. For the next two days, he stayed outside our house, coming up to our door, banging on it. When he got no response, he would come to the living room window and slam on that, shouting he knew we were home. He just wanted to be friends. Lots of things like that. Eventually, after almost a week of this, he finally fucked off. I know how weird it is now that my mom didn't just call the police or a friend for help, but I guess I can forgive her for suffering mental health issues at the time. As for the guy, though, I have no idea what he was thinking doing all that shit. This happened when I was around 12 years old. It was in the middle of the night at my home. My dad would work the graveyard shift at work. Since it was the weekend, I had stayed up most of the night. It was somewhere between midnight and 1am. My dad had told me to lock the doors and go to sleep, which I had done. I went to my room and finally fell to bed. After I went to my room, I had only slept for about an hour though. At around 2 a.m., I was suddenly woken up to the sound of knocking on my back door. It scared me wide awake. After taking a few moments to process what I'd just heard, I decided it was probably just my dad knocking on the door. Maybe he'd forgotten something. Being mentally exhausted, I knew he had a house key on him. I told myself he'd just unlock the door on his own eventually. But the knocking continued. It was pretty creepy. Next thing I knew, the knocking had suddenly stopped. Then it started again at a different location. Someone was knocking on the window to my kitchen. I continued to try and assure myself it was just my dad. I didn't understand, though. Why couldn't he just unlock the door himself? He always had the key on him. Thinking about this a bit more, I was starting to get pretty freaked out. I wasn't going to answer the door. If anything, my dad would eventually call me to open it for him. My phone was right next to me, but no such call ever came. The knocking started again at another window. I was terrified now, too scared to get up and check what was out there. The knocking would not stop. Next thing I know, it moved to the front door, and they began to slam at a harsher level too. That's when it hit me that I couldn't bring myself to move. I was frozen in fear. I couldn't bring myself to scream or talk or move any muscle. My heart was dropping as the knocking moved to a window closer and closer to my bedroom. My curtains were see-through. I couldn't do anything. I didn't know what I could do. I could only stay as my fear consumed me. I moved my eyes to the window. My heart skipped a beat when I saw a man peeking in through it, a tall man with a ski mask covering his face. I could hardly make out the details because it was so dark. His mask had some sort of skeleton design on it, and he tilted his head slightly as he noticed I'd seen him. I tried to say anything, but my words choked in my throat. I closed my eyes hard and started whispering to myself that it was not real over and over again. I opened my eyes. No one was there. I breathed a sigh of relief until I heard a loud whisper from outside. Open up or I'll cut you. Everything suddenly stopped. I could finally move again, but I couldn't really sleep anymore that night. It didn't feel like a dream. Everything felt so real. I don't know what happened, but I pray I'll never have to experience that again. It was one of the most frightening moments in my life I've ever dealt with. I couldn't find any trace of the guy after, though. I was home alone that day, too, so nobody could back me up. The following morning, I asked my dad when he came back from work if he'd come back earlier that day and knocked on my doors and windows. 
Of course he did not. This happened to me when I was a child, and I still remember it very clearly to this day. It set me up for a lifelong fear of being watched as I slept. I was six years old, and my family and I were living in public housing, and we'd just recently come to America. Our apartment was on the first floor, but slightly underground. My bedroom window was level with the ground outside. The windows were really big. I had a ledge right next to my bed which had my stuffed animals lined up and looking out the window. On this specific night, I was having a bit of trouble sleeping. There were these strange noises coming from outside my window, along with a rhythmic tapping. I peeped over to see what was happening, only to see a strange man crouching there, peeping through the gap between my curtains. He was looking directly at me, with the strangest look on his face. I started screaming and crying. My dad ran into the room to assure me that everything was okay and that I was just having a bad dream. I hadn't been sleeping though. I couldn't sleep that entire night. I had a weird feeling the whole night, as if I was being watched. My dad opened the curtains though, and nothing was ever there. To comfort me, he slept in my bed with me, but I still could not fall asleep. He, on the other hand, knocked out right away. It was getting later into the night, when the weird noises started again. It sounded like someone trying to cut through the screen and tapping on the window with the blade as he cut through with that motion. I woke my dad up quietly, trying to show him what I'd told him about before. He ripped the curtains open, only to see the man there with a the knife, cutting through the window screen. He jumped out of bed, ran for the door, and ran to chase the man who had been watching me sleep and trying to break into my room. He chased the man all the way to his car, but he sped off before my dad had a chance to confront him. My parents called the police and told them what happened, but nothing ever really came of it. From that night on, I had an irrational fear of sleeping by windows. I used to have night terrors about that incident for years. I hadn't thought about that for a while now, but recently I had another dream about it and couldn't stop thinking. I asked my dad about it recently, and he refused to talk to me about it at all. I'll preface this by saying this is a true story. We were staying in this fancy hotel for my cousin's wedding, and I was around 12 at this time. I woke up very suddenly that morning to a rough shove, assuming it was my sister waking me up. It was early morning, sometime around 7.30 or so. I groggily stepped out of the bed and was immediately hit with hairspray fumes. I could hear the sound of someone taking a shower, as well as loud hurried footsteps and repetitive spritzes of the hairspray can. I walked to the dresser and pulled out a blouse and a skirt. As I got dressed, I heard knocking on my door. I pulled my top fully on and opened it. No one was there. I was kind of freaked out right now, but I knew it must just be my imagination or something. After all, I was still half asleep. I exited the bedroom and heard the shower shut off as I passed by the laboratory. I then heard my father's heavy footsteps at the end of the hall. There was another restroom there. I could hear that same hairspray noise coming from inside, so I called out. Hey, Mom, if you're in there, I need to pee. Dad's in the other bathroom right now. I heard my mother's voice call back. Alrighty. It was definitely her voice, but that was not something she would ever reply with. I rolled my eyes, though, and walked away. I figured I should go wake my granddad, as I heard heavy snores coming from the room that he was sharing with my parents. In fact, I wondered why my parents hadn't woken him up yet. When I opened the door, though, I was extremely startled to find that the room was empty. Just then, the noises and smell of hairspray stopped as well. I ran downstairs, only to see that everyone else was already eating breakfast. I checked my watch and saw it was already 10 o'clock. My mom stared at me. What's wrong? I started to ask. My sister interrupted me. What the heck? I asked them what was wrong. My sister then replied. Didn't you just go to the bathroom? She pointed to the lavatory next to the small kitchen area. 
I walked over there and pressed my ear to the door. Sure enough, I could hear someone was in there, washing their hands. I shook it off at first and counted my fingers. All ten of them. It seemed I wasn't dreaming. I knocked on the door. Inside the bathroom, I heard a voice calling out, Alrighty! I looked over at my parents, sister, and granddad, who were all pale. Behind my back, I heard the lock click, followed by what I swear was my own voice saying, Hey there, Sarah! And footsteps. I turned around just in time to see my own feet, dressed in my black velvet flats, turning the corner on the staircase. At least, that's what it seemed. I felt paralyzed with fear, and goosebumps crept up my back immediately. I wasn't able to move for about a minute before I told my family about what happened a few moments ago. My sister told me that yesterday when she woke up, I wasn't in my bed, but she heard noises coming from the bathroom as well. When she went there, she saw someone that looked like me, walking down the hall in my pajamas. She called out to me, but they just kept walking. Well, when she went back to my room, she could see I was still sound asleep in my bed. She freaked out and didn't tell anyone. Fast forward to two years later, my cousin now has a six-month-old baby, and we're talking to each other over tea. Well, I shared with my cousin that story about what happened to me and my sister, and she immediately froze. What, you mean that happened to you too? I felt goosebumps return to my arms and legs. She then told me she had woken up and walked downstairs, only to see someone who looked like her husband sitting at the table eating cereal. He greeted her like normal and then said he was going to get something from upstairs. Well, it was taking him quite some time. Eventually, she felt concerned and went to check on him, only to find he was still fast asleep in his pajamas. This is an incident that happened to my grandfather in the past. It was in the 1970s. Let's call my grandfather Dada. He was around 38 to 40 years old at the time this happened. They used to live in Patna, Bihar. Now, for your information at that time, during the monsoon season, Patna used to get flooded a lot, and the danger of alligator attacks was also at its highest level. Every night he would go to the library, as he was very much into reading at that time. At the time of the monsoon, though, my Dada's elder brother used to accompany him to the library and back. After all, he didn't want to not go and find out his younger brother had died from an alligator attack or something. One day, they heard the rumor of a woman who practiced witchcraft roaming all around the city naked in the open air, killing humans for fun and dancing on their dead bodies. Apparently, she was a human being and nothing supernatural, but her mental condition was not exactly stable. The ignorant, superstitious people around thought she was a ghost. So, on to the encounter. One night, while returning from the library, he was crossing the mighty Ganga, which had alligators in it. There was no light, and both my Dada and Bro were obviously scared from this already. They had crossed the river. They didn't even realize it at the time when a dog arrived and his tail brushed against my Dada's knee. In that moment, he thought it was an alligator, but then he looked down to see he was already on land, safe and fine. Instead, though, when he looked up, he saw something far more frightening. They moved ahead just a bit and looked back to see there was a woman naked in the open air, sitting on the land muttering something to herself, her eyes moving up and down rapidly, and there was now no sign of that dog. The woman turned to face them and smiled. What's in the bag? None of your business. There are books. I can see. I can see. She repeated this several times over. Then she got to her feet and frog jumped towards them. She jumped three, four, five times and then was right in front of them. She leaned in and whispered, Can I kill you? What's wrong with you? Go back home! She started to scream and cry aloud, screaming out home over and over. At this point, my daughter took a stone from the ground and threw it next to her to startle her. She suddenly fainted and there, they ran away as fast as possible. After a few minutes, though, just when they thought they'd arrived in a safe place, she was right in front of them again. 
She had that stone in her hand now, acting like she was ready to kill them. My grandfather tried to think quick. His brother used to smoke and always carried cigarettes on him. I don't know if any of you know about this, but here there's this thought of narcotics being so intoxicating it makes the person sleepy and gloomy. He asked his brother to take out that patch of cigarettes and lit one, holding it out towards the woman. She threw the stone away and grabbed the cigarette. Then she smoked it for a bit before slowly dozing off, or so it seemed. They started running again. This time they looked back and saw the woman was missing once more, and they couldn't see where she was at all. They ran and ran, and never stopped until they arrived back home. The woman was about terrorizing people for some time after. Unfortunately, some days later, he heard the woman had been killed by a wild alligator. It seemed that even in death, her body was smiling. An unfortunate series of occurrences, to be sure. I still feel sick to my stomach whenever this memory pops back up. I was maybe 15 years old at the time, and my family had taken a trip to a ski resort in West Virginia. I'm the oldest out of two boys and a girl. The girl was maybe six at the time. She was adorable, big blue eyes and this crazy blonde hair. Bold and mature for her age because she'd grown up around all the big kids. My younger brother, who was maybe eight, and my aforementioned little sister, decided to hang out in the sauna with me. We had been to the resort a few times before, and I was 15 years old. That seemed like a reasonable age to go off for an hour or so with just me and my siblings. Well, stupidly, while in the sauna, we wanted something from the hotel room, or I think wanted to tell our parents something maybe. This was before you brought a cell phone everywhere you went. In our idiocy, we decided to send my little sister to go do it. Thinking back, I really can't believe we decided to do that. But you know how immature kids think. You get the one who's the youngest to do the tedious stuff. Well, some time had passed by, and we heard my sister come pounding down the hallway in her pink bathing suit, sprinting, with an older man chasing behind her. I'll never forget how he looked. He lunged forward, walking as quickly as he could. His eyes bore into my little sister. There was a tight frown on his face, framed by his white mustache. My brother and I watched in absolute shock, trying to understand what was going on. The sauna had a glass door looking down the hallway. I rushed out and grabbed my sister, pulling her into the sauna and staring at the man with wide eyes, scared but doing my best to be defensive. The man instantly froze when he saw us and began slowing down. Then he walked by the sauna like nothing had ever happened. It was at the end of the hallway though, so there was nowhere else really to go. Because of this, he stopped for a moment, then looked to a door right on the other side of the sauna that led to the gym, and mimed an, oh, as if that was what he'd been looking for the entire time. Mind you, he was wearing a collared shirt and slacks. He actually looked like he was shaking a bit. Needless to say, I asked my sister what exactly had happened. She said shortly after leaving the hotel room, the man had come out of nowhere and started following her all over the place. She got really scared and began running. He started running after her. I told my mom what happened, and of course she was so pissed we'd sent a little girl out in a bathing suit through this big-ass hotel all by herself. I still get sick when I think about what could have happened. If he'd grabbed her before she made it to the sauna, I can still see his gross mustache in my mind and get so angry when my mind replays his sheepish O oh, as if chasing a small girl down a hallway is a normal thing to do while looking for the gym. I felt guilty for a long time for sending her out and guilty for not saying something to him or reporting him. I sometimes wonder if he had done this before or after. In those moments, I try to remind myself just how young I was. I'm just glad I was there with them. Had it been just her and my little brother, who knows what could have happened.
I was about 15 when I got my first real job in West New York, New Jersey. My mom had sent me to live with my sister, who was 13 years older than me. She and I had recently gotten into a huge argument. So much so, in fact, that we hadn't spoken in well over a week. Because of our argument, I ended up taking the bus to work that week instead of letting her drive me there. This place always had a lot of people coming in and out. I mostly served coffee and pastries for the customers. I had just moved from New Jersey to Florida, and I've always been a relatively nice and polite person. Smile, be conversationally friendly. Well, apparently I left an impression on some man who hung around during the day to talk to me, and generally would just wait for me to get off. Again, I was 15, and this guy must have been well into his 40s. I kept on working, and as the hours passed, he would come and go, always checking in, and asking if I was almost done. I remember specifically him asking a lot of questions about when I was getting off. Did I live close by? Who was picking me up? The man seemed friendly enough, though, and I really didn't know better, so I kept on small talking throughout the day. I really didn't want to be rude to a customer and lose my first job. Well, I had a relatively short shift since I was so young. When my time to clock out came, I tried to leave without making a big deal about it. This guy was keeping a real close eye on me though, and started to follow me out of the establishment. He wanted to accompany me to my bus. He just wanted to make sure I'd get there okay, he said. The man grabbed me by the arm and told me to come with him. He basically stalked me the entire day, and now he saw his chance to make his move. At this point, I started to get pretty scared, since this was back before I had a cell phone, or even really before texting was invented. I didn't have a beeper either, so I had no way to call for help. I hadn't made it that far from my job yet. I was still in the parking lot. Like a bat out of hell though, my sister suddenly sped into the parking lot mad as hell. Needless to say, when she saw this guy tugging me in the opposite direction, she got even more mad. Of course she yelled at me and told me to get the fuck in the car. Then she proceeded to yell at and threaten the man who was very obviously trying to abduct me. He hauled ass away, and when she got me in the car, she started throwing out all kinds of expletives. What the fuck were you doing with him? Etc, etc. When I finally got the opportunity to tell her what actually happened, she gave me the tightest hug, and we both started crying together. To this day, this is the part we both couldn't really understand. She told me that she had been coming home from work that day. When she had a sudden nagging sensation, she had to pick me up from work right now. She didn't even know I was working that day but she had the sensation that she just needed to come get me. I worked a good 20 to 30 minutes away from our home. She proceeded to ignore this persistence at first. She parked, got into the elevator, and as soon as the doors closed, something inside of her screamed, and all of the alarms went off. She came back to get me, got into her car mad as hell that she was listening to this suspicious feeling or intuition or whatever that was alarming her. She didn't even think I was out of the house, but sure enough, she got there just in time. She's never experienced something like that since or ever before. I really don't know what to make of all of that. All I know is that she saved me that day. The guy kept trying to hang around, so I quit that job shortly thereafter, and she never allowed me to ride the bus there again or leave work alone. I moved to South Korea for university when I turned 18 years old. I'm 21 now, so this happened over two years ago now. Whilst there's definitely been unwanted attention from some guys in the past, most of them get the message that I'm not interested eventually. This, however, was a little bit more unsettling. The university I go to has an institute for language, which is where all of my classes were at the time. It's pretty common knowledge that most foreigners in this part of Korea would know of or study at this institute. 
It was not abnormal for me to receive random Facebook friend requests from guys wanting to learn English or make foreign friends. Most of the time, I'd just ignore them, unless we had a few mutual friends or I'd met them in person before. I got a friend request from this guy named Nico. We had quite a handful of mutual friends, and he'd message me too, saying he was sorry for the randomness of the request. He was just trying to make as many foreign friends as he could. Because he had so many mutual friends, I thought, what the heck? I accepted and messaged him back, saying it wasn't really a bother. From what I could tell by his Facebook photos, he was heavily pierced and tattooed, and stated he was Japanese. He had studied in Canada and could speak good English, and was also a foreigner studying at my university. After a few days, he messaged me again and I replied. It was a fairly casual conversation, and would often bring up maybe meeting for a coffee or a movie, which I declined. Suddenly though, he started getting more aggressive for no reason. Every time I'd make a comment, he'd find some way to turn it into an argument, which grew tiring super fast. I started to just ignore him. He'd often ask if I had a boyfriend, to which I'd reply no, and he'd bluntly say we should be together. It was at this point I decided I really didn't want anything more to do with him. I politely declined on the basis that I didn't know him, we'd never met in person, and we hadn't even known each other a full week. He didn't take my refusal very well. He began throwing insults at me based on my looks, and saying overly graphic things he'd do to me if he ever saw me. Evidently, I was being stupid not to take him up on the offer, because I'd never do better than him and he'd make me see that. It creeped me out beyond belief, needless to say, so I just blocked and deleted him on everything and tried to forget about it. I mentioned this to a friend of mine, and she immediately knew exactly who I was talking about. Apparently, I was not the first girl he'd added on Facebook and tried to bully into meeting him and being his girlfriend. After asking around with a few more of my friends who were listed as those mutual friends on Facebook, they all described pretty much the exact same situations involving this guy. One girl even told me she'd given him the benefit of the doubt and met up with him. It turned out he didn't even go to our university. He lived over an hour away and would travel there daily to watch and obsess over which girl he would find on Facebook next. He also told her he was born in America and had never even been to Japan, so who knows how much of what he said to anyone was actually true. I felt a bit freaked out by this, but I tried not to let it bother me. After all, I'd never actually seen him around, and I'd blocked him, so what more could happen? That was until about a week or two later. I received a message from him on Facebook from a different account saying how he'd seen me that day at school. This shook me up a lot since I hadn't even considered that he might actually be watching me in person. I ignored the message and blocked that account too. A few days later I got numerous messages all from different accounts claiming to be Nico's friends. They were saying how he'd had his account hacked. Could I please unblock him? so we could just explain everything and we could talk it over. I ignored all of these messages too. I just kept receiving more and more though, all of which I'm pretty sure were just Nico himself trying to reach out to get my attention. The more I ignored them, the more violent and aggressive the messages became. I could tell that most of the time when he said he'd seen me, he was lying. He'd say things like, I saw you at the library today, you fucking slut. You're a fucking four-eyed slut who can't get laid, and other messages to that extent. I knew he was clutching at straws because I never used the school's library to study, and although I wear glasses, I never wear them in public. Because of this, I was fairly confident he was all bluster. I just kept blocking the accounts and tried not to let it bother me too much. I figured he'd get bored enough soon and let it go. That was until one day after classes had finished. I was browsing the small convenience store in the building to grab a drink on my way home. I opened up the fridge to get a bottle of water, and when I closed the door, he was standing right there beside me. He didn't say anything, he just stared daggers at me. I hadn't ever seen him in person before, I'd never agreed to meet him, but I knew straight away this was him. Obviously I freaked out, 
I dropped the bottle in place and sprinted out of the store. I didn't walk straight home because I was afraid he'd follow me and find out where I lived. Instead, I went back into school and stayed around areas where there were lots of people until a friend of mine came to meet me. After that, I'd see him all the time when I'd leave class. He'd just be standing there, doing nothing in particular, watching people as they walked past. Then he'd stare at me intently. I made sure to always be with friends when I went to and from class from then on, and didn't go anywhere alone for a while. After a week or so, though, the messages suddenly stopped, and I didn't ever see him again. The last time I heard from him was about a year ago, when he messaged me on yet a new Facebook account, asking if we could be friends again because he'd changed, and it was all just a joke. Needless to say, I ignored that message, blocked that account too, and will not be taking up his offer on being friends. I was mindlessly browsing Facebook one day when I received a message to my inbox. Clicking on it, I realized it was from someone who I didn't know. His name was Peter, and he sent me this. Hi, I was taken aback by how beautiful you are in your picture. I hope you don't find that too forward. I saw you post on, insert local company's name here, Wall. I thought your comment was pretty funny. I couldn't resist clicking on your profile and messaging you. Your sense of humor is just like mine, and I'd like to thank you for making me laugh today. I just lost my mother a few months ago, you see, and I've had a real hard time with it. I can't remember the last time I smiled, let alone laughed, so really, thank you. Now, normally I would not reply to messages from people I don't know, but I felt really bad for this guy. I thanked him and told him I was sorry for his loss, and I was glad I could help him laugh. Once he sent me a friend request, I had to let him know, though, I didn't have any intentions of adding him. I only used Facebook for people I know. The guy said he understood, and we said our goodbyes. I thought that would be it. One day, about a week after getting his initial message, though, I was out shopping at the local grocery store nearby my home when I noticed a guy looking at me from a few feet away down the aisle I was in. I looked over and smiled nervously. I'm somewhat shy and socially awkward. He smiled back and waved, then looked at what was in front of him. He looked familiar, but I couldn't quite put my finger on from where. I checked out with my groceries and went home. After putting everything away, I sat down and logged on to Facebook, only to see I had a new message from him. I like the dress you wore today. It fits your body nicely. Thanks for smiling at me. It made me feel real special. I didn't realize that was him at the store, but seeing his picture again on Facebook definitely matched that guy. I was sort of sketched out by this, but of course, it could have just been a coincidence. We did live in the same area after all. I chose not to engage though, just to be safe. About another week goes by and I hadn't heard anything else from him. I was out with some friends at night at a park, just hanging out on the swings like we do when we were teenagers, when I noticed someone off in the distance. They were walking toward the park. My friends and I got spooked and went quiet immediately. I realized when the person was a bit closer that it was Peter. I spoke to my friends in a quiet voice. Don't panic. Act natural, but we need to leave now. Get in the car. They didn't argue. We got in the car together and drove away. Peter was now gone, though. I told my friends who that was and what had been going on. They told me I was just being paranoid. When I got home, though, I realized I had another message on Facebook again, once more from him. So, do you go to that park often? I noped the fuck out and replied, Do not ever message me again. My boyfriend is aware of the situation and he's a police officer, so leave me alone. I blocked him. Even though I made up the boyfriend thing to scare him, I guess it must have worked. I haven't heard from him or seen him again in months. I live with three people who all know what he looks like and know about the situation as well. They've been keeping a lookout and nothing suspicious has happened so far. That doesn't mean that I don't look over my shoulder every now and then though.
My husband and I moved to Texas for work a few years ago and moved into a lovely condo. He, however, is in the military and had spent the last three months deployed in Iraq. That means I've pretty much been living here by myself since then. It's been kind of weird, honestly. I married my husband right out of college, so I've never lived by myself before. The neighbors all knew he was gone, and I threw a big going-away party for him as well. The people in the building would stop by occasionally, inviting me over for dinner or to hang out with them or whatever. It definitely made me feel more at home by myself at least. Nothing weird happened for the first few months or so. I was careful about not going out alone at night. I locked all my doors, didn't talk to any strangers. It seemed to be going pretty well, safety-wise. That is, until just the other night. I was asleep in my bed when I heard a sudden banging on my front door. Like full-on about to bust the door down, pounding on the front door. Then, I heard a man shouting through it. Dallas Police! Open up! Like any good law-abiding citizen would, I very groggily threw on my robe and hoofed it over to my door, fully prepared to open it right away and see what I could do for Dallas's finest. Right as I was reaching toward it, though, for some reason, I froze. It dawned on me, and I thought, you know, this is really strange. What could the long arm of the law possibly want so urgently with a third-grade teacher that it couldn't wait until a more reasonable hour? I paused for a moment and looked out my peephole. All I could see was darkness. This was very odd. Even though it was nighttime, there was a light right outside my door. I should have been able to see something at least. I stepped back very perturbed, kind of standing there quietly in front of my door, evaluating the situation in my head. I wasn't really sure what I should do in this moment. After standing there, pounding on the door with me on the other side, and requesting I open it for a very impressive amount of time, it seemed to have stopped altogether. I just kind of stood there awkwardly with my cat, now very alarmed and very confused. Immediately after, I heard at least two people start talking in hushed tones. I don't think they knew I could still hear them. You know she knows we're here. Well, come on, let's just give it a minute. Man, she's gotta open the door. Fuck this shit, dude. Let's just get out of here. At that point, as soon as he said that, I knew there was something rotten in Denmark. No policeman was going to say all that. I was still kind of groggy, but at that point, I was awfully damn sure I was not going to open this door. I turned on my heel and ran back to my bedroom, where, like the fully grown woman that I am, I pulled the covers over my head and sat there silently listening. I woke up the next morning. The odd situation from the night before was far removed from my mind as I got dressed and ate breakfast. As I was leaving my house to go to work, though, I noticed something. There was a wad of tape over my peephole. I realized I should have called the actual police, so I took the opportunity to very calmly run back into my condo, lock the door, and call the law. And they came and confirmed the obvious. No actual policeman had been dispatched to my residence, or even anywhere near the entire building. And they couldn't really do anything now, though, but they said I should call them if the guys ever come back again. Here's hoping they never do. This happened when I was 21 years old. There had been a series of break-ins in my area around this time, and some of my neighbors had even been robbed at knife point. There had also been a few sexual assaults during those break-ins as well. At the time of this incident, no one had been caught for those crimes yet, so everyone was on ultra-high alert. I myself was scared to be alone in my home. I had been attacked in another similar incident before, and I was still traumatized from that event. Unfortunately, I was alone on this particular night. Something woke me up at about 1am. I was laying there in my bed, awake, wide alert and listening. I couldn't hear anything else at first, so I laughed at myself and assumed I must have just been dreaming. I went down to my kitchen to grab myself a cold drink to calm down. 
Now, my kitchen windows have no blinds on them, and therefore anyone out in the backyard can see inside. I had a back door light that I always kept on at night. As I closed my refrigerator door, which was slightly reflective, I could see the reflection of a man peering into my house. He must have climbed over my back wall. I could see the man holding something shiny in his hand. I was scared at this point. I didn't know what to do. Do I run to the living room and call the police? Do I start screaming? Do I try to run out the front door for help? A hundred different options flew through my mind in seconds. I decided to do this. I opened my refrigerator door again, put my cold drink back in, and took out half a watermelon that was lying in there. I grabbed a knife from the drawer next to me. I placed the watermelon on the kitchen counter. Then with the most maniacal, sick grin I could muster, I started stabbing the watermelon furiously on the open half. The juice was spraying everywhere. I laughed hysterically and stabbed and stabbed away, mainly because I was really fucking scared and truly hysterical at this point. With my clothes and hands dripping with watermelon juice, I turned towards the window and flashed the knife above my shoulders. The man was still there. I looked him dead in the eye and smiled as I licked the knife. It probably came out as a bit of a sneer. Doing the best crazy impression I could, I opened my eyes wide and then started to laugh into the night. I walked towards him, gripping the knife in my hands. The guy looked at me for a moment, then turned around and ran, screaming like a crazed maniac into the night. His screams woke the neighbors, who shouted after him to shut up. I never did call the police, mainly because I didn't really know what to tell them. I guess I didn't want to admit I would have done my best to stab that man had he not run away. I slept with my watermelon knife that night, and cleaned up the mess in the morning. So this happened around two years ago, when I was 20 years old. Backstory, I'm quite small actually. I was doing some shopping in town alone. I remember it was a warm Sunday afternoon. People were out and about with their families, and it was quite busy in the city center. I had some free time to myself, so I decided to pay my grandma a visit. To get to her place, you needed to take a 20-minute bus ride from where I was. On to the story now. I was waiting there for my bus to arrive, when I noticed a man staring at me. He didn't seem to be much older than I was. I remember he had on this very peculiar bright yellow hat as well. I usually don't care when someone looks at me, but this man was sort of looking at me like he was angry, like I had done something to offend him. Most people at the bus stop were either facing traffic or looking at the coming buses, but not this man. He had his back to the street and was just staring at me angrily. I got a weird feeling because of this. Still though, I saw my bus coming very soon and hoped he wouldn't get on as well. Of course, he followed on right behind me. I quickly slid into a window seat. Luckily for me, there was a kindly old lady sat next to me. She acted as a bit of a shield between me and the sky. The man stood next to our seat almost the entire ride, except for occasionally pacing around a couple of times. I was already quite freaked out by his behavior. I was texting my at-the-time boyfriend throughout the event. While he hadn't actually done anything to me, I was getting a really bad gut feeling about this guy. A few stops before mine, unfortunately the old lady had to depart from the bus. At this point the man's behavior became even stranger. He sat down next to me of course, which made me tense up right away. I refused to even look at my phone or text anyone in case he saw me typing something he could use to look me up later. I think he sensed he was making me tense up. He got back and went to standing next to my seat and staring at me. My stop came and I waited to the very last moment to get off. Of course, he also got off as well. What followed confirmed he was indeed after me. I guess in an attempt to put me off again, he ran ahead of me on the road, glancing back the entire way. Luckily for me though, him doing so gave me my only out from the situation. If he would have kept walking behind me, I would have been forced to either make a run for the apartment door and hope I was fast enough to close it before he got there, 
or run in a random direction and hope I reached a safe place before he did. I was out of the city center now, and there weren't many people around to help me. Because he decided to run ahead and wait for me, though, in that split moment, I decided to turn around and run in the other direction and dial my mom. It was pretty bad, but I decided to call my mom in case anything happened to me, so she would know who it was. I told my mom what was happening. Down the road, I spotted this small burger place. They would surely have a security guard. My mom told me to run for there and tell them what was going on. I ran as fast as I could. I saw the man had now turned around and noticed me going the other direction. He began fully sprinting after me. I was almost ready to cry. Luckily, I reached the burger place before he caught me. From the window, I could see him sprinting across the road. I guess him seeing me get into the place, though, threw him off. I have no idea why he fixated on me, why he seemed so angry, or what his plans were if he caught me, and I'm not sure I want to know. In 2010, I was living in Quincy, Massachusetts with my husband, a new baby, and a roommate. It was a Saturday, so I was taking a much-needed break from the little one and went to run some errands and have some alone time. My first stop was to the local radio shack to get a phone accessory. After my purchase, I walked out in deep thought about my to-do list, enjoying being Sans' baby for a day, when a voice broke through my reverie. Uh, excuse me, miss, could you help me for a moment? I blinked in confusion and looked over at the man who just addressed me. My first impression of him was Italian grandpa. Everything about him was beige. His khaki slacks, his cardigan and tweed flat cap, his sandy colored mustache even. Even the car he stood next to, a boat-sized town car, was a similar color. I hesitated a bit. As a big believer in the golden rule, I generally tried to help people out whenever I could. But this time, something about this situation gave me a bit of pause. I stood there in the middle of the parking lot. Uh, what did you need help with? I asked. The man smiled warmly. I think there's something wrong with my car. He held out his key fob. Whenever I click my car key, the door locks won't lock. It's very strange. You probably know more about this stuff than I do. Can you come over and take a look for me real quick? He gestured over to his car and clicked the fob in demonstration. Still hesitating, I said, I don't know anything about cars. We're right here at Radio Shack, though. Maybe they can help you out. No, 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 no. I think we can figure this out together. Come on, give it a quick look. Again, I repeated I didn't think I could help him. I could see he was getting very agitated, and yet he continued to force a smile. He walked over to the back of his car and popped open the trunk. Here's the strangest thing, though. The doors don't lock, but the trunk still will. He started waving at me eagerly. Come on, come take a look. I began to feel very confused. Part of me wanted to go over and help still, but my greater instincts prevailed. I began to walk away, repeating over and over to the man. I can't help you, just go inside and ask for help. As I started to walk away, I saw him throw his arms up in anger. He slammed down the trunk hopped in his car and drove away. I drove on to my next errand, feeling very unsettled. As I tried to process the encounter, I began to have doubts about my reaction, though. Maybe he really was just an old man that needed help. Did I do the right thing? When I returned home, I shared the encounter with my husband and roommate. I expected they'd laugh and assure me I was being overly paranoid. Instead, they looked at me with wide eyes. Apparently, this is a very common plot to try and kidnap someone in the area I'm from. I didn't report the incident to the police, as I didn't get useful information regarding the license plate number. I didn't think a man asking for help with his car counted as harassment in the moment. On a lark, I decided to Google attempted kidnappings in Quincy, in hopes that my search would turn up empty, that this would be a truly innocent, if awkward, encounter. Imagine my dismay when actual articles talking about this sort of thing popped up. 
I found a particular one and immediately recognized the perpetrator as that same man from the Radio Shack parking lot. A follow-up article revealed he actually lived in my old neighborhood. I often wonder if I was one of his first attempts at kidnapping and what would have happened to me if I had gone over to look in his trunk. This happened about two years ago. I was a junior in college, living in a small apartment off campus with one female roommate. We were both very busy students, and so rarely home at the same time. One afternoon, I was sitting there by myself working on a project. A white truck I didn't recognize pulled into the parking lot. I could see it stopping from my window. I didn't really think anything of it until I heard a knock at the door. A man, maybe in his mid-fifties, heavily bearded with dirty white overalls and a white cap, was standing there in front of it. I opened the door a bit, without letting him in. Hi, I'm, uh, with the realty company that owns the property. We're doing a routine check of the smoke detector batteries and air filters. This was strange to me. There had been a check done just a few months prior, and we weren't due for another yet. Additionally, the property manager almost always called ahead at least 24 hours, as per our lease agreement, to let us know the contractors they hired to do this stuff were coming. We hadn't been informed this time. I asked what company he was with, and if he had any sort of identification on him. His truck was unmarked after all, and neither his hat nor his shirt had any kind of logo on them. Uh, I don't usually carry that stuff around with me. My name is Charlie. It'll only take a few minutes. We're doing all the units in this area. It was very suspicious to me. He should have at least had something to identify he was who he said he was. I had that feeling in my gut that something was not right here. I told him I wouldn't be letting him in, and if he came back with ID, I would do so the next time. He got very angry but agreed to come back later. He hopped in his truck and drove off not going into any of the other apartments like he'd said he was going to. Heart pounding, I immediately shut and locked the door and called my roommate. She agreed it was weird and suggested I call the property manager. Huh, I don't recall sending anyone to the property today or recently. Why don't you call the contractor yourself and see what's up? When I called the contracting company and described the man... They said that not only did they not have anyone on that route today or any time soon, they of course also did not have a single employee by that name or that looked anything like the man I described. They said I should call the police. I was on edge for a few weeks, but the man never returned. I don't want to think about what his intentions were, entering the apartment of a college girl all by herself, and I also don't know why he only went to my apartment either. My parents shared this story with me some years ago, but I had forgotten about it until fairly recently. To give some context, I was born via C-section in a fairly decent hospital. At the time, it lacked a supervised parking lot, having instead an open parking space, whose sole guards were a group of people that would often clean the cars for a fee. Not that a C-section went badly or anything, but my mom had to stay some days in the hospital after I was born. She got a bit sick. I must say my dad is to this day yet to forgive any member of my mother's family for barely showing up to either visit or care for her. He never left us alone, as it was sadly very common back then to have kids snatched away, either by medical staff or random strangers. It doesn't happen that often anymore, but it was fairly rampant back then. By the time my mom and I were given the green light to go, my dad walked her to the parking lot. My mom was holding me in my blankets, and everything was going fairly normal, save for the fact it was getting quite dark out. Suddenly, they noticed a man approaching them, one hand inside his jacket. The guy was walking towards them at a seemingly slow pace. My parents knew right away, though, there was something off with this guy. My mom was in no condition to run, and my dad refused to leave her behind should this guy attack. 
and they silently decided it would be best if my mom let my dad run away with me if the situation arose. As they were still somewhat separated from the man, my dad pushed my mom in another direction, trying to go back to the hospital. The man called out in a raspy voice, You've got a pretty baby girl in your arms. May I see her? This raised alarms in both my parents. I was covered from head to toe in at least two layers of thick blankets. Only my mom could see my face, and they hadn't even talked to the man before. If he knew I was a girl, that must have meant he'd been following my parents from inside the hospital. They had little time to react, as the man quickly started to run at them. They knew they wouldn't make it back to the hospital on time. No other person was around the area to help, and they thought they were done for. Fortunately for them, one of the guards came rushing to their aid, screaming at the man. The dude was old, but he had enough strength to beat this weirdo good. What's better, the ruckus began to attract the other guards, who shielded my parents and beat the creep and forced him to run away, chasing him until he was nowhere near the hospital. Turned out the guard had actually seen the man from a distance, but it wasn't until he'd spotted my parents coming around the corner that he realized what was going on. My parents are forever grateful for the interference of those men, who not only saved them from being potentially killed, but also saved me from either being sold to another family illegally, or for other shadier business I don't even want to think about. This happened about a week ago. For context, I work in a school, which has just recently installed video cameras at our gates. Originally, you just had to buzz the gates, we would get a call, and they would say who they were, and why they were trying to come in. Obviously, you can imagine that people might lie about why they were trying to do so. Because of that, we recently installed the aforementioned cameras, so we could look at the gate whenever someone buzzed in. At around 12 p.m., we had a call from a parent who dropped their child off late, saying she had seen one man on a motorbike with no registration plate, wearing a ski mask. Someone in a van was following behind without a registration either, wearing a similar mask. They were driving outside the school together. She thought it was suspicious, so she called in to let us know. This didn't worry us too much initially. The school was protected quite well with some very firm security gates. At 1 p.m. or so, about halfway through lunch break, most of the kids had finished up eating. They were playing outside on a field or playground together. From certain sides of the school, you could see the kids playing on the field from the gates outside. The teachers didn't really supervise those kids out there. It was a high school, after all, and kids don't really need to be supervised at that age. As I'm doing my own thing, I peek over to the monitor for a moment, only to see said motorcycle drive up to the gates, and said van park up on the opposite side of the street. The man on the bike buzzed in, and said he was here to pick up his child. I went through with the standard protocol, and asked who he was, to which he only replied James. I then asked the name of his child, and he only said Matthew, and two very common names of course. I asked for his second name, and they said Thompson. Yet again, another very generic name. Because I had no life at the time, pretty much, I knew the majority of my pupils' names, as I dealt with classless quite a lot. I had never heard of a Matthew Thompson in this school. I don't even know why I bothered to ask them these questions. It was very clear this person was not a parent. Our security cameras were quite well hidden, so I assume the person asking didn't see them. I asked them to take off the masks they were wearing, which caused them to frantically look around. The man looked back at his friend in the van and made a let's go gesture. They started running and sped off. Pretty stupid of me, I know, but I had no idea how to handle the situation in the moment. I guess I should have gotten a colleague to call the police while they were still there. We did call the police after, but we never heard anything back. In 1987 or 1988 or so, I was eight or nine years old 
living in a blue-collar suburb of Seattle. My mom had just started working after being a stay-at-home mom for many years, so my dad would now get me and my brother off to school in the morning. I would wake up when my dad was just getting into the shower that was attached to the master bedroom and would pour myself a bowl of cereal and watch early morning cartoons. This morning was different though. As I was getting ready to do my morning routine, the phone suddenly rang. My dad was still in the shower, so I answered the phone myself. Cell phones were for rich people, and cordless phones were a thing but still a rarity. Our phone was connected to the wall. I sat down on my parents' bed and picked it up to answer. Hello? I said. Do you know who this is? Said the voice on the other end. It was an older man's voice. It sounded like my dad's, but not quite there. My dad didn't have many male friends. His best friend was his cousin, Jerry. And for some reason, I assumed this must be him. Hi, Jerry. My dad's still in the shower, I said. Oh, that's okay. I wanted to talk to you, actually. Say, do you want to come with me after school to get a nice present for your dad? Since I believed the person on the other end and they didn't dispute they were Jerry, I didn't feel threatened at all. I didn't feel uncomfortable or like there was anything wrong. Instead, I felt an opportunity to spend time with a family member and get my dad a nice surprise. I said something about that sounding fun and that I'd quite like to do it. I didn't even think it was odd at all, even though Jerry had never called that early in the morning and certainly never asked me to go with him anywhere alone before. All right, what are you going to be wearing? He asked. I was a little bit puzzled. I guess there were a lot of kids at my school and it might be hard to find me. I'm going to wear my favorite outfit today. A black and white sweater that says international news on it with a white turtleneck and some white stirrups, I said. Stirrups were really popular back then, and white pants were even more popular. For some reason, this part really sticks out in my memory, almost like it's permanently embedded into my brain. Maybe it was because my mom had just washed my favorite outfit and I was so excited to wear it. Maybe I knew deep down that something was off, though. I remember my voice fluctuating in the moment. I remember a feeling of excitement and a feeling of strangeness. You know, there's so many kids around, I might not find you. What do you look like again? You know what I look like, I giggled. That was the moment my dad rushed out of the shower. He must have heard me talking, because he walked into the bedroom and immediately said, Who are you talking to? Oh, it's just Jerry, I said. He grabbed the phone out of my hand, but as soon as he did so, the line went dead. And he hung it up. He asked me what I was talking about. I told him Jerry had said he was going to pick me up after school, and he wanted to know what I would be wearing. He told me that was not Jerry, and to not wear that outfit. I thought it was a bit odd when after that my dad picked me up from school, and continued to do so for several weeks after. My dad always worked until 5, and never went home early. He never mentioned the phone call, and never mentioned what his thoughts were. He didn't even talk to me about not telling people what I was wearing on the phone. We just never spoke about it again. About a year ago, I was listening to a podcast, and I got super freaked out when I heard a story about another girl that went missing after arranging to meet someone over the phone to get a surprise for her mother. We didn't live that close to each other, some states away, but it was eerily similar. It was the exact same type of call. Was someone trying to abduct me that day, or was it just a prank call? I guess I'll never find out. My family used to move around a whole lot. That meant that when I was younger, I was almost always changing schools. It got to be very hard to make friends, not only because of all the moving, but because I always expected to be leaving again very soon. And that kept me from wanting to form new attachments. We moved so often it seemed futile. I mostly just kept to myself whenever I entered a new school. Well, of course, anyone who's been to school knows exactly how the loners are treated, especially in middle school. That was where I was in my education when this story takes place. My family had just moved to a semi-rural area, 
I remember this being the worst time in my life, and I still consider it to be that way, honestly. I was in the seventh grade, and I remember this year I turned 13. I had always been a bit of a small kid, and the fact that I was so quiet and a loner just made this whole thing worse on me. The bullying started pretty early, and it got pretty nasty too. In fact, it had gotten so bad I would try to make myself sick in the morning to avoid going to school. I would wear wet socks to bed or put dirty things in my mouth. Back then, we actually thought something like that could make you sick. There was constant name-calling. Kids would always try to force me into fights with them. I never wanted to fight, and there was never any reason. I remember once these two bullies held me, while another burst a water balloon on me. Then they went around joking and telling everyone I had a wet dream. It was humiliating, just being at that school. The worst part is that the teachers never did anything about it. It happened on the bus, too. A few of the guys who gave me a hard time at school were on the same bus as me, and lived in the same general area I did. Fortunately, I lived 45 minutes away and out in the country, so being home was the best thing for me. I would never encounter anyone else who tormented me way out there. Summer vacation because of this was my favorite time of year. In that particular summer, it was even more welcome than before. I was able to just be home and not have to deal with the constant torment that was visited upon me. One of my favorite things to do was go out exploring into the woods. I would do that maybe a few times a week during the summer. There were a lot of woods in the area, so I was never short of spaces to explore. Sometime in the middle of the summer, I was out exploring in an area I'd never been in before. I'd come across some berry bushes and was surprised to find a good haul of blackberries. I decided I would pick them and bring some home, because they were pretty good actually. As I was walking along, I found a dead squirrel. It was obvious the squirrel had been shot and just left there to die. Whoever had shot it was doing it for fun, not for food. I found a bird in a similar condition. It was heartbreaking to see any of this. I wondered why people like to kill animals for fun. As I was out hiking this new area, I began to hear what sounded like footfalls every now and then. I'd never encountered any other people when I was out exploring before. I'd only once in a while come across an animal that wasn't a bird or a squirrel even, but I'd never seen anything dangerous out here. The footfalls I was hearing seemed like there was something bigger. I didn't think there were things like dangerous cats or anything like that around, but I did get a bit concerned when I heard what sounded like someone laughing. Then I knew if I had heard this correctly, there was a person out here in the woods following me. My first thought was I was about to get in trouble for trespassing. I didn't know who owned the land I was exploring on, so I began to get a little bit scared. I decided to go back towards my house, or at least try to find a road to walk along. I went off and kept hearing sounds that indicated someone was in the woods following me. I kept looking around, trying to see who it could be, but whenever I looked in the direction of the noises, they'd stop immediately, and I wouldn't see anything. Then I'd hear the laughing begin again. When I turned around to face it the last time, my heart froze in my chest. I was terrified. I was looking at a kid named Billy, one of my worst bullies in school. He was with a bully friend of his, Kyle, and the scariest thing of all was that both of them had rifles. They emerged from behind the trees to face me. I didn't know what to do. I was terrified at the scary looks on their faces. I thought about those dead animals. I was positive it was these two that had killed them. Kids my age shouldn't be out in the woods with rifles. I'm sorry. Being 13 and doing that sort of thing is just wrong. The proof I have of this? Both of them pointed their rifles at me right away. Billy taunted me, calling me horrible names and racial slurs. Then they said I was dead. I turned around to run. As soon as I did, I heard a gunshot ring out. I didn't feel anything, so I know I didn't get shot myself. But needless to say, I was terrified. I fell down to the ground. Kyle and Billy ran up to me and pointed their rifles at me. They called me names and made fun of me because I was scared. I didn't want to move. I just laid there on the ground, hearing their insults and being terrified. It was the worst feeling I'd ever had in my life. Then the most amazing thing happened. Billy, what the fuck are you doing? I heard a man's voice call out. 
Oh, uh, hey, Dad. We were just playing around, weren't we? He asked me. He had a look in his eye that said he would shoot me if I didn't agree. They were hunting me, I told Billy's dad. A huge man came up and grabbed the rifle out of Billy's hand and put it on the ground. He said four words I'll never forget. Cut me a switch. Billy looked terrified. He took out his pocket knife and cut a switch from a bush or something. He handed it to his dad, and his dad began to beat him with the switch in front of all of us. Billy was reduced to tears, and I could tell Kyle was scared he would be next, too. Lucky for him, Billy's dad deigned not to punish him. Help him up, the dad demanded, and Billy did as he was told. You apologize right now! Billy apologized, and the dad asked me if I was alright. I told him I was fine. He grabbed the rifle in one hand and Billy with the other, and he dragged the two of them off. I think Billy was going to be a lot worse for wear when he got home with his dad. Although my story does have a fortunate ending, it was a terrifying experience. Bullies are scary to begin with, but bullies willing to kill are much worse. Billy didn't bother me again after that. He just gave me horrible looks in school, but he never talked to me from then on. Several years ago, I worked at a crisis unit for the acutely mentally ill. It was a 10-bed unit where individuals would come to stay as a step down from psychiatric hospitalization or a diversion to prevent psychiatric hospitalization in the first place. I often worked alone on the weekends. One Friday evening, we received an admission, Michael. Background info was provided, with the referral indicating a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder, a recent release from prison as well, after serving a sentence for murder. I completed the initial intake meeting with Michael, during which time he said some sexually explicit things to me. I made it clear this was inappropriate, and that confidentiality was limited in that the staff working on the unit as part of his treatment team would be privy to anything he said, or anything said in subsequent one-on-one -on -one sessions. He responded well to that redirection. He finished the intake, and I went about the rest of my shift, until about 11 p.m. that night. He approached me in the office, and asked if I was working alone. Luckily, at that time, I was not alone. I told him my male co-worker was just in the adjoining office. After this encounter, I explained the situation to my co-worker, who read my shift summary and decided to sit down with Michael and tell him the way he was acting was not acceptable. He could risk being let go from the program if it continued. The next morning, I was working alone from 8am to 4pm. Around 9, I went to wake up another client, Jeremy, to administer his medications. The room Jeremy was assigned to was at the end of the hallway, and he was usually quite slow to get up in the mornings. While I was knocking on Jeremy's door, Michael approached me to tell me he didn't appreciate I'd shared the things he'd said to me with my co-worker. I explained to him that I'd already told him anything he said to me would be shared with the rest of the treatment team, regardless of how I felt about it. Michael became more agitated and jumped up in my face, backing me into the corner in front of Jeremy's bedroom door. At this point, Jeremy had woken up and heard what was happening outside his room. He came out of his room and stood between Michael and myself, and told Michael he needed to get the fuck out of there. Michael went back to his room, and I contacted my supervisor, who told me to document the encounter and continue with my shift. Needless to say, I left the job shortly after this incident. I'm thankful that Jeremy had the presence of mind to intervene on my behalf. Considering he was also a client with mental illness, I often wonder what would have happened if Jeremy hadn't woken up in that moment, or if he would have been in a severe state of mental delusion and would have become agitated as well. So this happened to me earlier, and I don't think I'll be sleeping tonight. I'm currently staying in a remote part of the United Kingdom and having a bit of a break from working. This means more time to pursue my hobbies, one of those being photography. I had scoped out a creepy-looking tree formation in a nearby forest. I set my camera and tripod up as the sun was coming down, you know, for that extra creepy vibe. 
As I was happily taking photos there, I see a woman pass the entrance to the arched trees. This woman had parked her car next to mine when I arrived. She went past a couple of times, looking at me for prolonged periods with each time she passed by. I assumed that maybe she wanted to come up this path but saw I was taking photos, and so decided to walk elsewhere for a moment. Approximately five minutes went by. She appeared again, this time walking towards me, dragging her left side slightly with a very strange limp. She stopped once and stared at me for a few moments, then started walking towards me again. I called out to ask her if she was okay. I was starting to put my things away at this point and readying my tripod for use in self-defense if necessary. The vibe she was giving was way off. She began to grunt at me, then stopped and stared again. At this point, this woman was close enough for me to realize that she was actually a man in women's clothing with a wig. An uncomfortable moment passed by. They began to grunt at me again, walking towards the edge of the path. They grabbed a pile of leaves and started throwing them around, grunting some more and then walking off aimlessly into the forest. I called my friend to tell her what just happened and asked that she stay on the phone in case this person came back. I wanted to just take a couple of more photos and then I'd be out. For a good ten minutes or so, though, I heard the crunching of leaves circling me in the forest. I tried to convince myself it was just wildlife. Suddenly, the sound stopped. I took the photos I wanted. I hadn't seen or heard the person for around 15 minutes now, so I assumed I must be safe. I leave the path and see that the car is also gone as well. Thank fuck. Very quickly though, I noticed there was a man walking towards me from the entrance. It was the exact same guy. He had changed into men's attire. As he walked past me, he shot me an evil grin that sent shivers down my spine. I don't scare easily, but this guy was just giving off all the wrong signals. An overwhelming feeling of dread washed over me. I was still on the phone at this point and holding my tripod over my shoulder just in case. I quickened my pace and got back into my car. As I did so, I saw him come out of the lane I had been down, stop and look around, then start walking towards my car with intent. I videoed this for a while, then hauled the fuck out of there driving past that car he had moved just down the road. I remember thinking to myself, what in the gray beard fuck just happened? 